Welcome everyone. We are so thrilled to be welcoming you to this panel discussion on anti-apartheid art and cultural movements from South Africa to Palestine today with amazing artists and cultural workers from across the world who have made huge impacts on history and are shaping the present day. Uh, my name is Hannah Priscilla Craig. I'm an artist and an organizer with Artists Against Apartheid, a cultural coordinator at the People's Forum. And I am so honored and so thrilled to be joined today by Tings Chalk of Tri Continental Institute for Social Research. We have an amazing panel set up um, and we're going to start by introducing some of the reasons behind Artists Against Apartheid. Art and culture play pivotal roles in shifting culture and shaping mass consciousness. In many ways, art and culture are part of our most significant and intimate moments in life. And for that reason, they can make a very powerful impact in shifting consciousness. We've seen this play out in history. Music, movies, TV shows, visual art have made significant impacts in popular consciousness and in shaping the future. And our enemies, the elite, the aggressors, Zionists know the great power of culture in transforming society. And that's why they pour so much energy into mass producing music and films that uphold their ideas and put violent and oppressive proposals on the forefront. And that's why we know that as people of movements for liberation, we have to make art and take art and culture seriously as a tool on the battleground of ideas. We can't let the oppressors have the prime time, but we must overcome and win on the cultural battlefront. We've seen the great power of culture and art in people's movements throughout history. The legacy of Miriam Makeba bringing the music of anti-apartheid movements into the minds and the hearts of people on the radio throughout the world. Those, the, these, these historical mo mo movements and moments in cultural work live on. And we have so much more to learn from the past to bring us into the liberation movements of today. The banner of Artists Against Apartheid was formed in October of last year as a tool to bring together artists across the world together to make an impact in the current movement against genocide, occupation, apartheid of the Zionist regime against the Palestinian people. Artists have always played an important role in movements, but our movements have to be cultivated. We have to learn from history in order to effectively build today. So in October, we launched a letter affirming artists' important role in the struggle for liberation and in spreading the message of solidarity. After its launch, over 11,000 artists all over the world have signed on to the statement. It's still open for signing, so be sure to sign on at againstapartheid.art. But now it's going even further. The, the artists and, and cultural workers of the world are bringing their crafts, their tools to the streets, to the people, bringing the message of solidarity and the liberation of Palestinian people to the world. We see beautiful Palestinian posters on streets in Barcelona, Johannesburg, Atlanta. Musicians are releasing songs of solidarity, hosting concerts for Gaza. Artists are speaking out on their platforms in support of the movement. And there's so much more in the works and being planned today. Of course, we are also seeing repression by institutions of our enemies, blacklisting artists for their support of the movement. But we know we are stronger together. And as artists, we are sticking together. Artists play a significant role, not only in envisioning a possible future, but in building the confidence of the people to stay in the streets, to maintain and grow the energy of the movement and to build excitement for a liberated future. Today, we are joined by artists and organizers who have made historic contributions to the struggle against apartheid. We will see directly the connections between liberation struggles in South Africa and in Palestine and learn from the inroads that these artists have made and paved the way for artists today to integrate movements with art and culture. We know that internationalism and connecting in movements across the world is an imperative part of our work historically and in today. And in this panel's discussion today with Wally Sorote, Clarissa Bittar, Judy Seidman and Nikki Franco, we will talk about the connections of our work across space and time. 
So with that, I'm thrilled to introduce my comrade and friend who has made such an important impact in people's movements for art and culture through the Tricontinental Institute for Social Research and beyond. She is a writer, artist, organizer, and more, and will introduce the new dossier by Tricontinental, which this panel discussion launches called Culture as a Weapon of Struggle, the Medu Art Ensemble and S Southern African Liberation. Please welcome Tings Cha. Thank you so much, Hannah, and to all the friends and comrades at the People's Forum and Artists Against Apartheid, and everyone watching and joining us today. Um, so in preparing for this event, I was looking back at some of our history, uh, at a set of important dates that sometimes can feel remote from our reality, um, but to me they seem very relevant to our present moment, and I want to share some reflections before passing the word to our invited guests. So this year, 2024, marks the 30th anniversary after the end of the apartheid regime in South Africa. And it's been 3.5 months since the genocidal bombings began in Gaza. Today is also the 100th anniversary of the death of an important comrade, that's Lenin, who beyond, of course, spearheading the Russian Revolution of 1917, that changed the future of humanity in the world, he also understood deeply the cause of national liberation and of self-determination for the colonized world and for the third world. And I think today on all the panelists here will understand well that the cause for self-determination and national liberation is still unfinished. And probably no other place is this as clear as in Palestine. And born on the same year as Lenin's death, there was another great revolutionary a Pan-Africanist who understood that national liberation isn't just about economic and political struggle, but it's also a deeply cultural one. And that's Amilcar Cabral. And just yesterday, coincidentally, was the anniversary of his death. And so why am I saying all this? Why talk about history at all? And how does history serve the present? Uh, for us at Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, and especially through the art department, which I have the privilege to help lead, we've been focusing on ener our energy at looking at history. And every year we have published a dossier that recovers the art and cultural practice, as well as theory of struggles for national liberation and for socialism, from Cuba to Indonesia, from China to South Africa. And most recently, and what this event today is launching, is the dossier that um, Hannah already mentioned. And we're very honored to hear more about these experiences from two comrades who were in the trenches of that South African anti-apartheid struggle and who were members of the Medu Art Ensemble. Over the last few years, I have the privilege of talking with members of Medu and going through the archives of their work. Because for us, the story of Medu is not just a South or Southern African story, but very much an international one. Because no single liberation struggle is an island. No single liberation struggle can exist without the circulation, the exchange of ideas, the strategies, the material resources of political solidarity and exchange of culture across the globe. In other words, there is no struggle culture of national liberation that is not at once bound up with internationalism. And during the six years of existence from 1979 to 1985, Medu Art and Sofa built and innovated and drew from the cultural practices of African, Asian, and Latin American struggles for national liberation. And today we bring that history back to feed the present struggles, especially in the global South, where the struggles for national liberation have not yet ended. So how does art serve our struggles in this process? And I, there's another date I wanna draw our attention to, and that's two days from now on the 23rd of January, it will mark the passing of Jonas Gwangwa and Hugh Masekelo, two legendary South African jazz musicians who were both deeply involved in the anti-apartheid struggle and also members of NEDU. A comrade in South Africa reminded me this morning of an interview that Jonas gave a few years before his death. He talked about the time of armed struggle and also of cultural struggle. And he said, it was something exciting because everyone was ready for the gun, but this, was a different gun. And this reminded me a lot of what the Chinese revolutionary process. Mao Zedong talked about the importance of having two armies, an army of guns and an army of pens or of cultural workers. 
And in that same interview, Jonas Bongwa said that when performing a song or creating any piece of artwork, we're actually putting the life of the people on the stage. And in the context of South Africa, it was to show the world what life was like for the people of South Africa under apartheid. But of course, it's not enough for an art to show or to feel the pain of others. A work of art must drive us to reflect, to ask for ourselves, well, what are we going to do about it? Art must drive us to act. And when we act, we don't act alone. We must act together with the people, the oppressed, the working classes. We have to organize. And this reminds me of one of the great minds of Medu, who was Tami Mnyele, whose life was cut short in a massive raid organized by the apartheid state in 1985. He wrote about this relationship between artistic creation and political organization. I think themes that we're trying to touch on in today's event. And he said that it was in the Medu Art Ensemble where the role of the artist concretized itself. The role of an artist is to learn, is to teach each other, is to ceaselessly search for ways and means of achieving freedom. Art itself cannot overthrow a government but it can inspire change. And it's in the spirit that we are having this conversation today. And so to wrap up my opening uh, uh, remarks, it's been 30 years since the South African people fought and won their liberation. The Palestinian people still have not won their liberation. So what can we learn from their history? And writing about the story of Medu and talking about that today, about the Southern African liberation struggles, isn't just a nostalgic endeavor and actually isn't a nostalgic endeavor at all. Uh, Frantz Fanon, another revolutionary, told us that we have to use the past with the intention of opening the future as an invitation to action and as a basis of hope. And I just want to repeat that line for a minute. To open the future as an invitation to action and as a basis of hope. And so art, therefore, has the capacity to capture our collective victories, our defeats, and our aspirations the story of Medu Art Ensemble, the story of the struggle for Palestinian liberation, and to turn them into a mobilizing force for the struggles of today and those yet to come. And I firmly believe that the artist has a responsibility to do so. So with today's event, we hope we can stimulate and inspire this collective responsibility that we have as artists, as cultural workers, as activists, and ultimately as human beings. So with that, I'm going to pass the word to our first panelist, that's Wally Siroti, who is many things. Among them is the National Poet Laureate of South Africa, the founding chairperson of Medu Art Ensemble, the former CEO of Freedom Park, which is one of my favorite spaces and cultural uh, museums in South Africa, and someone who I'm proud to call a friend and a comrade. So I have a question for you, Wally. Um, when the movement against apartheid in South Africa said, culture is a weapon of struggle, what did this mean in theory and in practice? And can you share a little bit with us today about the relationship between uh, the struggle for South African liberation and that of Palestine? And I'll pass the word to you. Thanks, Comrade Wally. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade uh, Ting Kwan. And also thank you, comrades and colleagues present. Many thanks for this opportunity to go back in time, but to also look ahead, focusing on the role of arts and culture in the past, but also in the present as we examine the saying that culture is a weapon of struggle. It is important to state that the ANC unit which was eventually given the, the responsibility to embark on engaging arts and culture activity to serve our people through the struggle for the emergence of a non-racial, non-sexist and democratic South Africa were most inspired by the then ANC president, Comrade Paul Oliver Tambo, when he said after he received the report about the progress for the formation of Miru Art Ensemble, and I paraphrase, remember that arts, culture, and heritage have the possibility and potential to unite our people and the world to fight against 
the apartheid system. We not only believed but committed as cultural activists to the fact that our people and country, South Africa, are anchored on centuries of the struggle for liberation. We therefore understood and believed that the South African nation will always express its commitment to the struggle for liberation. We therefore understood and be sorry, uh, struggle for the liberation of the nation and our country through its history and culture, and therefore also through the arts. As we served our people as cultural workers, being conscious and aware of the, of the pillars of the struggle, namely mass mobilization, international support, underground and armed struggle, as waged by the African National Congress, we honed into this understanding in Medu Art Ensemble in search of new ways to harness that innate being. We had to create new ways and platforms, leaning, leaning on our political understanding, history, and where possible on science, not only to harness the varied and diverse arts and creativity which existed, but to also amplify the creativity and expression of the creative acumen of the arts and cultural workers. We believed and committed to the fact that while arts and culture activity is a creative process to portray and to depict the value of a nation, nations, and the world as a mirror, as a mirror does, cultural workers must also be so creative and committed to shape, mold, and create arts and culture expression to intervene so that arts and culture become the tools to shape, create, and or contribute to the national political consciousness for forever to defy and dismantle the apartheid policies, laws, and system, and to initiate the betterment of the quality of life of the people, the nation, and contribution to the to world at large. The evidence of that possibility existed in our country, inspired by the creativity of the masses in our country, but also by how the international community has responded through the movement to implement the international support of the liberation of our country through sanctions, boycotts, demonstrations, and the support of the strategic objective of the struggle to create a non-racial, non-sexist, democratic South Africa. I am suggesting here that besides the fact that eventually, when Muri was established, it became very important and essential that there was a common understanding as different cultural workers responded to the call of Midu that Midu at the name suggests will be anchored and will participate in the struggle against the apartheid regime and therefore fight to destroy the apartheid system guided by the four pillars of struggle but to very but very important being absolutely creative in employing the seven art forms, namely literature, theater, dance, photography, film, posters, stroke, plastic arts, sculpture, and music. That is where the weapon comes from. However, more important is what must the arts do to result in nurturing a culture, a consciousness, a commitment, on the one hand, for the creatives to serve the people. On the other, for the nation to be stoic and committed through conscious, consciousness and, and conscious activity and deliberate effort at, and action to not only fight against the apartheid system, but to also defend the strategic objective of the struggle in the future. That was the challenge then it is still the challenge today. And I move to the poem which I wrote 
in support of the people of Palestine after that which I've just read. We we keeping look we keep looking this way and that way. We know this road. The siren is blaring all sound into oblivion in the world. The siren, the siren, the siren rings in the heart and blares hearing and sight to be deaf and blind. The siren screams and blasts the ears and brain of the human race. The earth is in a scream. The siren screams, the siren scream is like a strong, blinding, fierce light into the sight of the human race. We keep looking this way and that way, that way and this way. Something must be done. We keep looking, searching where on earth will understanding come from, where from, from on earth will the power come from to call a halt to the blinding, blaring, deafening siren. Ah, this world, my brother, this world, my sister, where, where from will help come from? From whom in this world? Ah, Palestine. We ask the ear, we ask the eye, we ask the mind, we ask the heart. Has the human race run away? Run away to hide its sight and ear, ran and hid, hid its being away? Wherefrom will understanding step in and stop this carnage? The siren is blaring in our being. Wherefrom? From whom? We hear in our ears, deep in our minds and eyes, in our being. We hear from the wind, even from the sunlight, obliterate, obliterate Palestine, obliterate, obliterate Palestine, bloody Palestine, obliterate Palestine, obliterate this history, culture, and being. This echoes, this echoes, this echoes an echo as wood the being of the mountain when it echoes. They must not be alone. Please, they must not be alone. The people of Palestine, Palestine must not be alone. We wish, we think, we feel, we hope as hopelessness attempts to embrace us. We see, we wriggle out of it. The Palestinians are alone on earth. In the world, they are alone. Please, please, they must not be alone. They cannot be alone on earth. In the world, they must not be alone. They cannot be alone. They must not be alone. They cannot be alone. Many of them perish as we say so, as we keep saying so. Many children die. I am afraid to count how many children because even one is too, too many. We hear in our eyes the sounds of the siren and of the explosion as it blasts our eye and hearing and the red fire flares its coming in the air with the power of a storm. The red hot fire flesh in its red hot dance it was preceded by a thick black smoke which bellows and rages on. Oh, human race, it rages in the air and sky. The deafening sound of the bomb above skyscrapers in the sky towards the earth. The fire flares turning the heavens crimson. This, as a siren, is fading into an eerie silence eerie quiet, the fire, the smoke, the deafening sound of the tears, skyscrapers, houses and buildings apart like a pack of cards break and break and cement crumbles. 
to the earth to be a heap of earth, the last grave of men, women, and children. We see this and feel their painful slow death under the rubble as their death begin. We hear this rumble, raw and raw, as the sight whispers to us. We hear this, we feel this deep, deep in our minds, hearts and being. From far away we feel this, the silence of death. We see this, we hear this, we feel this, we own it now. Ah, Palestine. Victories cannot be won from sides. Palestine forever. Palestine, the Palestinian will be here on earth forever. Forever Palestine, forever. In our minds, in our hearts, in our being as human beings, for their cry is a human cry humane to the human race. Palestinians own their victory, culture, and history to live forever here, now. The denied two-state begins its, really, its reality now, to emerge for real as two states begins to be, to be present forever on earth like a baobab tree under the sky, under the sun under the moon, Palestine must stand, stands on her language, culture, history, on her people and being, firm as her flag flaps in the skies in the world, like the dress of a young lady dancing in the wind under the sun, forever flapping and flapping. Ah, Palestine, be. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Comrade Wally, for sharing that historical context and inspiring another generation of artists and cultural workers struggling against apartheid internationally and for sharing that powerful, powerful poem about Palestine. I think we will all be revisiting, revisiting it much in the next coming um, weeks and months. So thank you so much for joining us. I am now so honored to introduce Clarissa Batar, an award-winning Palestinian oud musician and composer born, raised, and based in Los Angeles. They have performed in front of audiences around the US and internationally incorporating oud with a multitude of genres from R&B to hip hop to rap to pop. Their music has been featured um, on the radio, in film, in exhibitions across the world. They have released a joint poetry Oud EP with Palestinian poet and activist Mohammed Al Kurd um, titled Belly Dancing on Wounds, which is a beautiful collection of poems expressing the experiences of the Palestinian people. And you can listen to their latest album, Hassan Sabi, which is out on all streaming platforms. Definitely check it out. Clarissa, we are so excited to have you here and to hear from you about your work and its position as a tool in collective struggle. Um, music has always been an important medium in struggle. So could you talk a little bit about how music has been used in the struggle of Palestinian people and how this tradition informs your own work? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you all so much for having me first off. Thank you for, um, the People's Forum and for the Artists Against Apartheid for having me. It's uh, it's an honor to be here and on this panel with such esteemed guests. So uh, your question is, I feel like it's it's a big one. You can talk about it for a long time, but um, it's definitely music and politics with con within the context of Palestinian liberation have always been very tied. Um, you know, um, in terms of fostering a national identity and creating a sense of unity and also resisting in a way that transcends even physical borders or being able to actually be in the same space um, 
as the people that you might be creating with. Music has always been this way that transcends those limitations, I think. And, um, you know, within, within the context of Palestinian liberation, you have m m countless examples of uh, the Israeli regime um, outlying not just, I mean, not just music, but I mean, even art in terms of art, like how the colors were outlawed and how people of Palestinian resistance. And that's the same thing happened within the context of music. And, you know, during the first Intifada, um, there were very political um, albums that were put out. Um, for example, Riyadh Awad, uh, 1987, that was banned by Israel because it was um, said to be propaganda for Palestinian propaganda. So that's, you know, a, a, a very direct example of how threatened I think um, the Israeli regime and just, you know, oppressive regimes are of the power of music and the power that it has to engage the public and unite people and also um, convey political messages in a way that um, I think a lot of times easier, more, more easily consumed by the masses, um, or at least you can at, um, memorize really easily. Um, and it's something that I don't know what how the brain works with music, but you could you could hear a song and it could be you know ten years ago and you'll you'll still remember the lyrics or remember how the song should be sung. And I think that there's something in the brain um, that happens when we commit something to memory through music. And from a political sense, I think that can be very powerful. Um, and I think that that's a huge tool that that people should be using um, to their advantage and in, in, in a way to like push forward political messages. And I, I see myself very much in that tradition as an artist and as a musician. Um, you know, I I grew up uh, and I wanted to play Oud first. It was a way of just connecting with my identity as a Palestinian. And, you know, growing up in diaspora, there's all these different layers of how that um, how that made me feel closer to home and how that made me connect and also connect with my family and my grandparents. And then later on that like continued to be, I think a real source of, um, a real source of con connection for the community um, in diaspora where I would have people reaching out and telling me, you know, just hearing that, oh, I haven't heard it in so long in person and live. And, you know, that just brings me back or reminds me of my grandparents or makes me feel like I'm back home or that felt so special. And I think, you know, not just on a, not just on a, a political engagement um, level, but also on a like personal healing level. And when you have gone through so much as a people, when you, you know, there's so much trauma that you inherit <laughs> and you, you walk around with. And I think that when that's a continual thing as well, you know, like watching this genocide unfold these past couple of months has just been so emotionally difficult um, and draining. And I think that in a lot of ways, um, music has been a source of comfort for the community here, at least in my experience, people have, you know, said that this, you know, it's been very healing to hear these types of songs, folk songs, or just, you know, traditional Palestinian songs that make them feel closer or that, that um, heal them on a very, I think, ancestral level. Uh, so I think that, you know, there's a very, there's a deep power that that has. And I think that that's something that, you know, I always, I'm always really um, amazed that it has such a, like, such a strong effect on me and on my community as well. And for the people around me. So that's that's in in one context. I mean, like, yeah, it has very much a, a deep, strong historical connection. Even like groups like Hamas put out uh, songs and to like energize the public, to build support, to provide entertainment, but also to to provide a sense of unity and to to give some sense of like, um, you know just to build polit political efficacy, I think that's just something that, you know, has a, a 
it's, it's, there's a long tradition, not just with Hamas, but a, a lot of organizations, um, and also not just within Palestine. I and mean, you can see groups even like Hezbollah have done that as well. But I think that that just it's, it speaks larger to the context of power of music to resist um, and the power that that has. And so uh, I think in, yeah, in the, in the terms of uh, for Palestinian resistance, this is just something that I think we're part of a long tradition, long standing tradition, given that we've been occupied for so many years, um, given that this is one of the few like mediums that uh, working a lot of songs like, for example, when I was working on this, uh, a release that I recently had with Muhammad al kurd as the poet and my father was singing on the track and we called the, the song Nasak, which means your people. And uh, that song was a like direct diss kind of towards the Oslo Accords, but also, you know, against the occupation, but also against the, the people who um, are collaborators and people who are in our own government, the Palestinian government that that are collaborators with with the regime. So I think that um, you know, for us when we were making that song, that was us, you know, solidifying this, creating this um, this memory of like how how we feel in the moment about this this Oslo Accords coming up, and like how can we solidify this feeling, and how can we hold that and I think music has that power to like solidify this memory and hold it and keep it for future generations in the same way that we listen to music from the first intifada and we're like wow this is really reflecting what was going on there and I think that's something that I I hope to be continuing and part of that tradition um so yeah there's there's a lot there but <laughs> I think that's something that uh it's it's a tied it's a tied tradition, you know, like we're saying, it's a, their music is a weapon. It's a vehicle for change and for, for um, igniting the public and getting them excited about, a, a, you know, an idea or a moment or whatever that might be. And, you know, we uh, even more recently are like working on a, a part two to this, the song Nasek that we released. And I, I really, you know, I, this song Nasek, I mean, I, t I tend to try to, I like when my material is very explicitly political and people were telling me like, oh, you know, you watch out, don't release that, you're gonna get in trouble, you know, or they're gonna get mad at you. And I'm like, okay, that's good, I'm doing my job then. That if they're gonna, if it's gonna piss somebody off, then it's probably a good thing. Um, so this like next one that we're working, on, I'm actually very excited for, which is, is like a, um, it, it's a, a song that talks about settler colonialism in a very explicit way and it's titled Shlomo, which is the name of a settler. And um, yeah, and it talks about this settler that came from Poland and wants to settle in us and like wants to come to Palestine and then all this explicit um, stuff. It's very comedic and like in a way very much within the Palestinian tradition of like using sarcasm to express pain and, you know, your reality. But it's a, it's something that I'm also like, you know, we've been working on and I'm looking forward to dropping just because of, you know, what, what it reflects, I guess, in this current moment that we're in. And, um, yeah. So <laughs> I could probably go off for days up, but I hopefully I answered the question. <laughs> Thanks very much, Clarissa. And we're looking forward to the new check um, that you're about to launch. I think what you shared is very linked to something that South African Carla was telling me recently about in the context of anti-apartheid struggle, you know, when a comrade was killed, when there was a strike being organized, when a leader was exiled, there would be a, almost a spontaneous, you know, song creation to mark that moment of history, to continue telling that story and, and telling that story uh, and making sure it doesn't get um, forgotten. And this gets passed down to next generation. So I think there's an important dialogue about how song almost reaches the hearts and minds before any other life form. Um, and so with that, I think um, I'm going to make a segue to our next uh, speaker, uh, Judy Seidman, who is a cultural worker and a visual artist, uh, now living and working in Johannesburg. Um, she's born in the United States, but has spent most of her life contributing to um, the South African liberation struggles, living across many different countries in exile, and also as a member of the Medu Art Ensemble both in the graphics and publication units. And she's played an incredible role in preserving the history and the archives of Midi. 
And so the question for you, and I think is linked to what Clarissa has just talked about, is that since it, it's been three decades since the end of the South African apartheid regime, many people might not remember the process or the struggle itself, but the songs or the visuals, including many of the ones you've made and some of them that I see in your background, those have stayed with us. Um, so what do you think we can learn from this history to help us build international solidarity through culture today? And I'll pass it on to you, Judy. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much for hosting this, for inviting me to talk about this. And I'm very honored to be on this panel with people talking about some of the key issues facing us today as artists. Um, and as I, I think as uh, Clarissa just said, I can tell this is a very large question. I'm sure I can go on for hours, but I'll try and just hit key points perhaps. The question, I'd like to slightly rephrase it to say that what can we learn from South Africa's culture as a weapon of struggle? that can help us to use culture to build international solidarity, but also to build internationalist culture. Um, and I'd like that addition because as artists working both within a nationalist struggle and within an internationalist struggle, we are talking about how we create our work and what it speaks to. To answer this question, we first need to look at what we as cultural activists see as the key principles of culture as a weapon of struggle. Cultural struggle first and foremost, as has been said in the introduction, but can be repeated over and over again, it's critical, um, builds the voice and the vision of oppressed peoples as individuals and communities. First and foremost, international solidarity culture and international struggle culture needs to recognize and build the expression of people's culture. So as we look at people's daily culture, how they live their lives in a situation of oppression, also how the culture of struggle incorporates that trying to find happens, people uses. It happens in all of the art forms. It happens in public expression. It happens in dance, in toy toy, and in song, and in, in every way that people can communicate between each other. Um, we also need to build and support people's voices of resistance and liberation. And in doing that, we need to create art forms. We need to create space and physical capacity and economic potential for the oppressed to express their own experiences. This happens in a whole range of innovative forms as well as in the classic art forms, whether it's guerrilla theater and toy toy, public murals and posters, and as Clarissa was saying, in song, in, in all its variations, poetry. Um, and it also happens in things like public speeches by community leaders, by leaders, by political leaders sometimes. Those are also part of the culture we're creating. And we need to consciously develop links with and cultural production within the people's movements and within the liberation struggles itself, as Barwali was saying. That's a critical part. It's on the one hand, you have the daily culture people live with and have constructed just to get through their lives. On the other hand, you have the struggle to change those lives, to create a vision, to create a future and all of the awareness and perception that goes into that. 
The second issue we need to think about in looking at this question is the flip side of people's culture, which is that the oppressive regimes, and that's all forms of oppressive regimes, whether we're talking about colonialist and imperialist conquest to fascism and dictatorships, these have systematically sil silenced and denied people's existing voices. And um, when we say this, it's really important to remember that the so-called cancel culture was used by oppressive regimes against people's cultures long before it was even called cancel culture and long before it was blamed on progressive forces. <laughs> it's, it's been used against artists and people's artists for as long as there has been oppression. Silencing voices and now structures the tactic of whether settler or imperialist or both. It's been a key pillar of apartheid, and it's been a function of class generation across the world. Oppressed people are not merely silent and voiceless, they have been silenced. It looks like we may have lost. Oh. Oh. We, we lost you for uh, a moment, Judy, but I think we can hear you now. Go can ahead. you hear me now? I, I just what? wanted to, okay, I'll just repeat the last line. I don't know where you lost me. Um, <laughs> but that um, basically there's a reason that erasing the culture of oppressed people is considered one of the acts that constitute what we call genocide. So oppressive culture enforces silencing with laws, economic and social institutions, and of course, with straight force. They kill artists, we know that. Um, we know that both from Medu and we know it from Palestine and we know it from everywhere as there's been a political struggle with culture involved, which everywhere. Oppressive regimes ban voices of popular expression, the regime's cultural institutions and structures use cultural workers to employees who are subject to labor laws in practice, laws governing copyright and ownership of creative private collective ideas, and art markets are constructed and controlled for private profit. To quote the South African cultural worker Matsumela Manaka, he said, Art like the land belong to work on it. And in fact, we know oppressive regimes take the art away from us most of the time. And this repression of people's art is embedded in international culture, cultural structures as well. So when we talk about a key aspect of cultural structure is to identify and confront these mechanisms, which restrict, deny, deny and limit the voices of the at an international level, as well as within the repressive regimes. Um, so there are the key issues we need about using culture for international support and solidarity, and also in developing an international culture of liberation that speaks to all of our people. Um, and out of this, there are a couple of key principles which I'll just mention quite quickly. Firstly, both inside the have you lost me? You're going in and out, but now, now yeah. we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. So, to boycott oppressive culture, oppressor culture, both inside the regime itself and internationally. Um, this was done in the South African struggle very, very successfully. It was brought it out, it was one of the key pillars of um, cultural struggle. 
but when we say internally, it means we have to look at making sure that where culture is created to support the oppressor, which it is, it does not become a justification for that oppressor internationally. We have to protest people who are justifying the regimes outside every time they show up. And we have to point out that while they are saying, look, we've made this beautiful aesthetic, whatever entertaining thing that comes out of our country, we are still murdering hundreds and thousands of people on a daily basis. And destroying the culture We can, as artists, allow this kind of um, whitewashing, perhaps is the term, to you internationally. Um, we also have to pre prevent. Judy, I think we we lost you there, but I think it was actually a, a really beautiful moment to to start to segue into our next presentation. I think what you said about um, the importance of creating a vision for the future, artists taking up the role to to also recognize the uh, the ways that outside forces justify regimes. Um, is a really important segue into the next presenter um, who can talk a little bit more about fighting against apartheid from within the belly of the beast. Um, I'm really happy to welcome Nikki Franco, who is an incredible writer, podcaster, community organizer, facilitator of spaces for collective study. Um, Nikki's work exper experiments with truth telling, radical history, pleasure, joy, and revolutionary imagination. She curates educational and cultural programming that navigates the current urgency on global solidarity, environmental and ancestral preservation. She's the host of the podcast, Getting to the Root of It with Venus Ruth, which is available for streaming wherever you get your podcasts. Um, and Nikki has been really pivotal in organizing Artists Against Apartheid in the United States. So I'm, I'm so proud and honored to call her my comrade. Um, Nikki, you are an internationalist organizer and cultural worker based in the United States. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what it looks like to be a revolutionary artist or cultural worker from within the belly of the beast in this moment. What role do cultural workers play in the struggle from within the empire and in building solidarity with international struggles like in Palestine? Yeah, well, I, I think first off, thanks so much, Hannah. I, and I wanna acknowledge just what an iconic uh, lineup this is. And I feel really humbled and grateful to be part of this. Um, I think before I can totally sort of offer some visions for the future, I might wanna go back a little bit personally and I, I think the first point I think of is when I personally first began to reckon and realize what my role as an artist is. And that was some time ago when I was a teenager and I was in my hometown of Miami, Florida. And I think Miami, Florida, just to locate it in the conversation, is a place that is uniquely counter-revolutionary within the belly of the beast. It's a place that's a sort of safe haven for right-wing fascists. And, and that sort of doesn't only show up in the economic level or the political landscape, but of course also in the culture that comes out of that city and the sort of culture that we consume. I think as social ruptures were happening in my youth, I began to realize that I was feeling at odds with the culture, sort of all the culture and the so-called art all around me. And I can say for myself and, and for a lot of people that that is a really isolating feeling. It makes you feel alone and at times maybe even crazy. 
And I think in that time, I began to learn a lesson that I still hold really close to my heart. And it's the sort of realization that the way to combat those feelings of alienation are not going to be by being in yourself or just hyper individual, but actually by sort of creating collectively and also making a commitment. And I think for me, it was a commitment to the land, to people, and also a commitment to building socialism, even in a place that um, you can't, you know, you cannot utter that word without some direct, um, yeah, some direct conflict or some direct pushback from everyone around you. Um, in that time, I was thinking of how to bring that commitment more to life, how to embody that commitment with other artists around me and began to sort of build out and help co-found a queer art collective for queer artists of color in South Florida called Femme Power. And, you know, we were quite young, so we didn't have all of the revolutionary theory or the language, and we're still quite early in our own respective disciplines and practices. Um, but there was something really beautiful that happened in the process of building the collective um, and, and that network out. You know, some of the things we began to experiment with were, of course, we had our book club to sort of regain and reclaim our history that had been strategically robbed from us, um, especially in a place like Florida, where many of us are immigrants from Latin America and the Caribbean, um, where many revolutionary experiments have played out and either been squashed by the U.S. empire or continue to um, resists. So of course we did some book clubs, we did art installations, we did guerrilla street art, banner drops, wheat pasting posters, we experimented with music and doing sonic soundscapes or mixes that incorporated maybe contemporary electronic music with the speeches of revolutionary leaders and making it more just easier to disseminate and popularize amongst young people people um, and not just in South Florida, not just in the South, but of course, all over. Um, I think that process throughout the years for me was really transformative and a personal and a spiritual level. And of course, as an artist, I think, I mean, some basic ways, of course, it sort of upped all of our skills, right? We became curators, we became multidisciplinary artists, we became organizers, and we sort of owned that title of cultural worker. And we also sort of deepened our own understanding of the world. We made connections from South Florida to Cuba, to Puerto Rico, to Palestine, to South Africa, to Brazil, to Mexico, and really all over the world. And I think in some ways, maybe the one of the more important things that happened in that process was also it expanded each of our understanding and our belief of what is possible in our lifetime and afterwards. Um, and I think now, just to bring it back home, I think many years later, I'm finding myself in a similar or somewhat of a like a parallel place. Um, and I think, you know, so many of the artists I speak to who might not even identify as cultural workers might not be entirely sure what that really means and the legacy of that term. But so many artists that have incredible talents, um, feeling really desperate and longing for a sort of network, a collective of other artists to sort of create with, um, learn alongside with, and make meaningful contributions with. And you know, I think we, particularly as American artists, have a unique responsibility to sort of withdraw any ounce of consent for the sort of unspeakable horror and genocide that our government and our taxpayer money does in our sort of behalf and in our name. But I think, you know, I think, Hannah, to your point, I feel really excited about Artists Against Apartheid and how it's uh, sort of kicked off and emerged with so much energy and so much enthusiasm because I think for us, for young artists, and not just young artists, but I think for artists in the belly of the beast, in the sort of hub of empire, in this historic moment of Palestinian liberation, I think it, it sort of, yeah, it sort of draws a line in the sand for us to make a choice. And I think that's exciting. I think we get to actually sort of 
become part of a tapestry of revolutionary artists in all corners of the globe and sort of contribute to that legacy of, I think, becoming more human, becoming more of ourselves and returning to ourselves. And maybe I want to just, um, just close off with a Grace Lee Boggs quote where she talks about, you know, she says, to make a revolution, people must not only struggle against existing institutions, they must make a philosophical and spiritual leap and become more human human beings. And in order to change and transform the world, they must change and transform themselves. And I, yeah, I think so much of what we do as artists is constantly evolving and morphing into new iterations of ourselves and how beautiful it is that we get to make a choice to also do that for the world around us. Thank you very much, Nikki, for that and, and for sharing your personal and also the collective experience, uh, experiences that you've been a part of. Um, I think today we've had uh, four interventions or, or um, from four uh, great cultural workers uh, spanning different continents, um, bringing to us the idea of this cultural of a we as a weapon of struggle in different contexts across artistic languages as a tool that marks, communicates, and carries important moments of struggle. And also a reminder that struggle for national liberation is also at what's bound up with an international struggle. I think one of the other things that have come out in the interventions is around how different historical conjunctures actually inspire and necessitate artistic creation. But that work isn't done just on an individual basis. It also it must be done in a collective uh, basis as part of building people's organization of the working class and of the oppressed. Uh, from the Palestinian struggles for Palestinian struggle for liberation that Clarissa talked about, and the experience of the Medu Art Ensemble that was formed in exile in Botswana in the late 1970s, um, and as well as to today, where a young generation of artists in the belly of the beast are organizing around the artists against apartheid. So in this final moment, I'd like to give um, two minutes of, of just final comments, any words of inspiration for our, uh, in, uh, for our participants, young cultural artists and activists who are trying to get engaged in political struggle. Um, and so I'll pass two minutes to each of our speakers. Um, first of all, um, I'll hand it over to Wally. Comrade Wally, are you there with some final remarks? Um, I think maybe let's let's wait for uh, Comrade Wally to come back onto the call. Oh, there you are. I see you now. Can you hear us? Good evening once again. Final thought. I must thank everybody for <coughs> being here, but also the uh, team for having invited us to explore these very, very, very difficult thoughts, but of creation, especially during this time when the world is completely uh, unstable, when the world is uh, threatened by greed, violence, and imperialism. It is very important that we are here to find a manner to ensure that culture is becomes a weapon of struggle, to mobilize our people, to conscientize our people, to create commitments among our people, but for also for them to commit themselves so that we can learn from what they do to create new art forms, to improve art forms that are there so that Palestines do not happen again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Colonel Wally. And next I'll pass it on to Clar Clarissa. Yeah, I think thinking about this right now, um, in like the 100 plus days of genocide that we've been experiencing, I think 
um, in order to keep strength and endurance in this struggle and uh, all struggles against imperialism and colonialism and uh, for oppressed people, I think that um, it's a very important moment right now to produce this work and to whatever medium you work in or whatever whatever way that you can contribute um, and in whatever way that you can counteract, obviously, the um, horrific silence that, you know, especially in this country we've been experiencing. Um, I think that it's an important moment for us to to use that as an as a call to action. And so, you know, whatever, whatever it may be, whatever medium you work in, um, I think it's huge for us to just feel completely detached and as if there's nothing um, or, you know, hopeless. I think even in, for the most um, engaged of people, I think witnessing the continual genocide go on and on for days with, you know, it's been it's been emotionally uh, draining and exhausting, and so I think that you know we have to be countering that in every way possible. And so I think that's just what you know I'd like to leave on, and and in this moment, you know, given that probably a lot of the people listening now are artists or um, connected in some way to the arts, or however you can use your voice, you know, however you can express that, I think is is really crucial in this moment, um, and will continue to be for for all uh, struggles ag uh, against oppression. Before we pass, uh, and I'll pass it over to you, Judy. Okay. I guess I'd like to just say that I'd like to reaffirm what's been said by the two previous speakers and to say that the kinds of discussion we're having here where we look at a collective, where we look at how we can work together, where we can look at how we build upon each other's work, other's work and put it into the context of actually building an international understanding that deals with an international oppression is critical. And I would like to thank Artists Against Apartheid for organizing this. And hopefully this will be the first of much more interaction between artists and liberation struggles going forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. And I'll pass the final words to Nikki. Yeah, I think I, I, I just want to close out by affirming what everyone has already said and, you know, maybe also reflecting on the fact that I think Palestinians right now are teaching us what embodying courage looks like and what making revolution possible actually means and and what the sacrifices that are, it requires and necessitates so i know so many of us as artists in the empire and the belly of the beast face or are, are afraid of repression or what that means for just um our ability to practice and and you know find jobs and what that may mean for us here but i think we actually are seeing right now a very real model of what courage looks like. And I actually don't think we have the luxury or can afford ourselves the luxury of um, leaning into fear. I think right now is just an, a truly historic moment. And at best, I think we're lucky to be part of this historical legacy of contributing towards revolutionary possibility. What an incredible discussion, everyone. Um, we're truly learning from historical movements and building up revolutionary artistic and cultural consciousness in the urgent moment that we are living through right now. Every single day, the situation is changing. Um, just last week, we saw a huge show of international solidarity when the government of South Africa brought Israel to the International Court of Justice, accusing Israel of genocide in Gaza with support from you know, progressive states across the world um, and people rallying behind this recognition of the genocide that is taking place. So we're really seeing from South Africa to Palestine, international movements of artists and cultural workers 
And the, the huge impact that they can make in building solidarity and the confidence of the people for the larger movement. And it really continues on. Um, we welcome everyone here to build artistic and creative projects using your own artistic tools. Organize art actions under the banner of Artists Against Apartheid. Um, you can visit our website againstapartheid.art for a full toolkit and ideas for mobilizing. Um, make sure to follow us on Instagram at againstapartheid.art. Send us a message with questions, ideas, and interests. I think all of the panelists today have shown examples of, you know, both the importance of organizing and mobilizing as artists and creative people, um, but also the ways that um, small projects can contribute to a larger shift in consciousness. So there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, be sure to read the Tricontinental Dossier, Culture as a Weapon of Struggle, the Medu Art Ensemble and Southern African Liberation on Tricontinental's website, thetricontinental.org. Um, we will see you soon online, in the streets, and everywhere that creative expression can be made for the end of the genocide, occupation, and apartheid system, and for the total liberation of Palestine. I want to thank our panelists one last time for their incredible contributions. Thank you to Tings and Tricontinental, um, the People's Forum for hosting us, and we will see you all soon in the streets. Free Palestine! <laughs>